so today's session we'll try to make it a little bit of fun a little bit of more deep insights but definitely something you can take home and ponder upon in your daily lives and the topic being how do we win the war within my first question to you prabhu uh, how do you define the inner war or the inner battle and uh, what are the primary battles we face in our minds and hearts well even in today's world there is this term that people have got some demons inside them like say when sachin tendulkar was about to score his 100th century it became like a big psychological baggage on and he is at 99th century before that so making a century is not another one century is not a big deal but it is there different terms you take the monkey on the back or a mental burden so basically the idea that there is something inside us that works against us that something which we all experience in our lives and the essence of the battle is this thing say hey, i want to move in one direction but there is something inside me which is pushing me in the opposite direction and that force inside me which is pushing me in a direction that i know is not good for me that is the force against which we need to fight so basically you could say the inner battle is against the forces within that stop us from becoming the best version of ourselves now the specifics of what that inner battle is what are the forces inside against whom we are fighting we could go into the details of that but in essence the inner battle is that we all have unrealized potentials and to some extent we know the path to realize those potentials and yet something seems to stop us slow us or completely sabotage us in trying to go there and we may see this very often especially in sports where in sports there are players who just get some attack of nerves lose their cool and they self destruct but in some ways sports can be a macrocos microcosm for life so that's the inner battle fighting against the forces that stop us from being the best version of ourselves so when you talk of uh, fighting against forces that uh, stop us from being the best version of ourselves everyone would agree with me that there's a constant battle between pleasure and purpose and at times when the pur- when purpose gets the better of you you have a fear that oh life will get a little bo- little boring mm. when pleasure gets the best of the better of you you think how oh, life's getting meaningless or how do, how do you make sense of this prabhu yeah hmm. see that's why in the gita when it talks about the lower self and the higher self there are two verses 6.5 and 6.6 6.5 is udhared atmanatmanam natmanam avasadayet atmai vai atmano vanva atmai vai ripuratmanah so it's saying that there is a part of us which is observer and there is a part of us which is the reactor you could say actor but i'm specifically using the word reactor things happen and we react to it and now what krishna is saying is now in some tradition this is called as the higher self and the lower self so krishna is telling us that the higher self should act in such a way that we go upwards and not that the lower self acts and pull the higher self downwards so elevate yourself with yourself don't degrade yourself with yours that's the idea now this can be done in two distinct ways and the two ways have opposite results one is some people think self improvement means that my higher self goes higher up and my lower self i bury it deep underground so this creates a lot of inner tension but the, so if this is what is being done that means say i know i should not get angry and he somebody does something which enrages me but i issues all my will power i just 
dominate myself and don't express any emotion at all. And I can do it once, twice, maybe 50 times, maybe 100 times. But the 101st time, I'll explode. And that time it might be a small trigger, but my explosion will not be just because of that small thing the person did. Now all the 100 things will come. So actual growth is not this. So if we think you know, my higher self will dominate the lower self, it doesn't work. So you could say the higher self is looking for purpose, let's be correct with your question. The lower self is looking for nation. So ideally speaking what should happen is, if say this was the original situation, the higher self and the lower self, gradually both go upwards. The higher self goes upward, the lower self also goes up. That means that the things I seek pleasure in, they also grow higher. As a child, somebody might seek pleasure in just playing with toys. Now as we grow older, we don't speak, seek pleasure necessarily in those things. We do need pleasure. So it's like the part of us which seeks for higher purpose, that definitely goes higher. But the part of us which seeks pleasure, that also goes higher. And that's why there has to be an inner dialogue. It's not a domination of the higher self by the lower self. If we are trying in the inner war, so the second verse I'll talk about to just complete this point that when Krishna says, sometimes this dynamic is used with the mind and the intelligence. So the mind is considered to be the enemy sometimes. But normally, if you have an enemy, you just want to kill them. But Krishna doesn't say kill your mind. Krishna, what does he say about the mind? Make it your friend. So, why is that? That's because the mind is a part of us. So, it's more of integration of the two parts of us. Not the domination of one part by the other part. So each individual will have to find out how this negotiation can be done appropriately. So what is the balance of pleasure and purpose that each one can find, that each individual has to decide. And of course we can take guidance from others, but it's like there is, we could say, there is the present me and then there is the potential me. So now, if I pander only to the present me all the time, oh, well, this is what I enjoy, right? That's what I do. I, I, I go watching movies, I, I go to parties, I enjoy those things. So if the present me is all that we are pandering to, then that will lead to stagnation. I'll stay where I am. I've never grown. I was in Chicago and I was in university. There's one boy who had a t-shirt. You are perfect as you are. Now, a lot of people like to have some affirmations and do some positive things, which is fair enough. But now you can say, you are valuable as you are, you are treasured as you are, you are loved as you are. But to say you are perfect as you are, that means there's no room for improvement. Can you even say that? That's unhealthy. So, if we are pandering only to the present me, we will stagnate. Not only stagnate, there can also be degradation. You can stagnate means stay where we are, degradation means go lower down. On the other hand, if we are we are caring only for the future me, the potential me, then what will happen is then we suffer. Yeah, I know this is good for the future, but for the future me to come, the present me also has to survive. The present me is feeling so pressured for this role, this discipline, don't do this, can't do this. It won't work for them. So now, this balance between the present me and the future. The Krishna says, Yukta Ahara Vihar is here. That Yukta is regulated. So how much to care for the present me, how much to care for the future. So you could say the present me is connected with all the nature. The future me is connected with purpose. Generally when we use the word purpose, it is about somewhere we plan to go in the future. 
So we have to find that balance. And each person will find it different. So that's why that inner discussion is important. Sometimes you may go too much in the direction of pleasure. Sometimes you may go too much in the direction of purpose. And then we all learn. And we grow. So it's not that we want to make, we want to dominate ourselves and make ourselves our slave. We can prove one point. It's like I have been to America almost six to nine months a year for the last 10 years. Not America, the Western world, America, UK, Australia, New Zealand. Spending a lot of time there. So it's almost like the Indian parenting or Eastern parenting in general is more of concern for the future, future child. And the Western parenting is concerned for the present child. Now, if both can have their positives and both can have their negatives. So in the West, if you go to university, any of the Ivy League universities, so they don't have admission by merit. Because if they had admission by merit, they would be filled with Chinese and Indians. So it's like no other denomination can match with the competitive ability of Indians and Chinese. So they have their own diversity quotas and an Indian with 4.9 CGPA will not get into Harvard. But, uh, but a black with 3.9 CGPA or a Latino with 3.9 CGPA will get in. But they have their reasons. They say we want to have a diverse community over there, which is okay. But the point I'm making here is that uh, the Indian way of parenting, where they focus on the future, it brings results in terms of making sure that the kids have a good career. You, now, in America, Indians are the wealthiest minority. Among all the denominations, there are many immigrants in America, but Indians are the wealthiest minority. And Indians are considered what they call the model minority. That any immigrant who comes there, they say we would like them to be Indian. Indians are respected and you can say Indians are envied over there. So, but the problem with this is, often people get railroaded or straightjacketed into particular careers which the parents think will be good for the children. And that can become a problem. But in the West, children are given too much autonomy. And it's like, you decide whatever you want to do. I was with an American devotee couple and their daughter had just finished her 12th. No, she just finished her 10th. And then she, basically she was going to go from school to college. So I asked her which field is she going to take? And the father looked at his daughter, and at his, the daughter was not there. Father looked at his the mother, the husband looked at his wife, and he said, hey, they never asked him what she wanted to do this. So it was not even a topic of discussion. <laughs> in India, probably that's in second standard, we get to be a topic of discussion what you're going to do after 12. So sometimes too much autonomy creates problems. So it's not there. Are of course, brilliant kids in America also, I'm not denying that. But the overall performance, I started with a statistic of all the Ivy League universities being filled with Indians and Chinese. Because when the kids are given too much autonomy, they will be concerned only about the present. Not so much of the potential. And that it becomes a problem. So there could be both extremes where a person feels suffocated or a person stagnates. So what applies to parent to children, we can say we eventually each one of us to, has to become like a parent for the child within us. And rather than consider the lower self to be an enemy which has to be destroyed, actually it has to be transformed. So the lower self also has to be integrated. And so that over a period of time, even the lower self will rise upwards. And that actual transformation. It's not that the lower self gets buried. So it's like, I'll explain on last one, what the lower self rising means. So we will all get angry at times. Life is provocative, people are provocative, and we are provocable. So, we will all get angry. But as we get spiritualized, as the word in the way is purified, as we get purified, our anger will be within different boundaries. Say, there will be different boundaries for, our, for somebody's anger. Some people, some people, when they get angry, they, in America, guns are easily available. Somebody can take a gun and shoot. It's a horrible thing. Somebody might take a knife. In America, in UK, there are no guns allowed, but people have knives and they go around killing with knives. So somebody may get angry and they may raise their fist. 
somebody may get angry and they may speak severe words somebody get angry and raise their voice so now each of these is an expression of anger as we get purified it is not that we won't get angry but even our anger will be within different limits maybe in the past when i got angry i would want to hit some now when i get angry i may raise my voice i may not speak severe words so that's how the even the lower self starts rising mm-hmm. Is it addressing the question? Yes, bro. Yes, yes. And I love the point where you made uh, you uh, don't bury your lower self, but address it. Uh, negotiate with it. Not address it. Negotiate with it. Because that lower self is also a part of us. It is not. It may be working against us right now, but it is still a part of us. You got to make peace with it. Yes. Yeah. on our terms not in terms <laughs> of course you can say on mutually acceptable terms but primarily our terms in like one of the main reasons for the second world war they say was after the first world war ended uh, the allies they imposed really humiliating terms on germany that the treaty of versailles which was which was the reason why hitler was able to invoke the german national pride they were totally humiliated after Now, as contrast to that, America and you, the Axis, I pause, learned the lessons. The Japan was hugely bombed. Weirdos. Even now, uh, war historians they debate whether the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was necessary. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But in spite of that, after that, Japan and America didn't become enemies. So, what was the difference? You know, Germany was split into two parts. and germany didn't become an all the the allied powers bomb germany germany didn't become any because you know, that, that 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 the underlying it was not the, all the citizens over there were bad you know so there were some power hungry politicians there some people who followed those politicians or military leaders but once they were removed then, then the country was helped to grow the country was helped by america to progress like what india has done in kashmir No, it is not that we okay now to control Kampur Kashmir to destroy Kashmir. We had to destroy those people who were completely against India. But after that, we have to equip and help the other residents of Kashmir to flourish. And that's how that there's a relatively greater peace over there. So there's definitely a fight required. But the fight, the inner war, it's not like dropping an atom bomb and destroying the whole lower self. Is there some parts of the lower self which are unacceptable? like when i get angry okay i may say that okay using foul words that's unacceptable but if i say anger itself is unacceptable no it's natural we can just that there are times when we all get angry and basically anger is because we care anger is an expensive emotion it's very expensive for the body it's expensive for the mind If somebody gets angry about something, that means they really care for them. So anger is natural. If I start the anger itself is unacceptable, the only way to do that is stop caring for anything. You know. Then you will never get angry. But that doesn't work. We cannot live like that if we don't care for it. We don't care for anything. That means we have no purpose in our life, no cause to live for. So anger is not a bad thing. So that's why dominating the lower self would mean that's. outlawing anger itself but negotiating with the lower self would mean that, okay this expression of anger is unacceptable is that difference yeah yeah, yeah. makes makes sense prabhu prabhu you spoke about the stark difference between parenting uh, in the eastern world and the western world i was surprised this time uh, uh, during janmashtami there was a 3 year old kid I mean, not three-year-old. He was in his third third standard, and he came up to me and said, "Prabhu, Prabhu, were you in IIT?" I said, "IIT? You know, I wish, but I was uh, never in IIT." What surprised me is someone in the third grade knew what IIT is. I've heard se- seventh standard kids speaking about preparing for JEE, which blows my mind out. Uh, Prabhu, uh, the 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 difference between autonomy 
and focusing on the future me that you said is is that something that is inherent or, or is that even uh, influenced by your external circumstances by my inherent you talking about the parents or about the children or both uh, both prabhu when there is a mainstream ethos in every society there are different political systems in the world and if i say politics i'm not talking about politics but i'm talking more about political philosophy so there is the right which is more conservative there is left and there is liberal some the left and liberal along are mixed together but they are different so right generally speaking the right is concerned with hierarchy their idea is those people who are on the right they are concerned with hierarchy this is the person in authority this is the person subordinate you obey this and by this order will be made so hierarchy is the biggest value like in military hierarchy is important now the commander gives the command you have to follow it so there are some places where hierarchy is essential but the right is primarily concerned with hierarchy and generally those on the right are conservative so india is broadly a conservative place china is also conservative russia is also generally eastern world is conservative overall now the left is concerned their defining value is equality that communism was driven by the idea that all people are equal and so their idea is that okay there is this hierarchy this hierarchy is causing a problem in society or those who are at the bottom of the hierarchy are being exploited therefore we should have equality and now there is truth to that also it is possible that those at the bottom of the uh, hierarchy could be exploited but what communism overlooks is that or what co- communism assumes that all hierarchies are hierarchies of power and all hierarchies are constructed by the powerful exploiting the powerless but hierarchy could also be of competence you know if if say we have a heart attack and they rush to a hospital and they say equality anybody can do the heart surgery <laughs> that won't work is it so you have to train for that so a hierarchy could be a hierarchy of competence that possibility is there now is it that a person on top will always be more competent on this so when any of these values is absolutized that becomes a problem so the left soviet russia earlier was leftist that was equality now america was neither right nor left primarily america was driven by liberal values and liberal values is more about autonomy autonomy is basically you let me do my thing so there is a social structure and that social structure is what the hierarchy wants to preserve the left says the social structure is the problem that's what we want to destroy the liberal say i don't mind the structure is there leave me out of it i'm not going to i'm not going to fight against the social structure but just let me do what i want to so be broadly speaking these three are very different philosophical ways of looking at the world so for example india is a federation federation means the center gives powers to the state america is a confederation confederation means the states give power to the center at any time any state in america can decide we want to secede from america and they can secede it's not easy but they can do it so the idea is that the way india was designed hierarchy was more now all of these they can function their own way in their own space now i talk about you know, ultimately if there is love not in the sentimental like teenager sense but love in the sense of service and dedication then any of these h e a l that's an acronym you know bhakti is ultimately about loving service so all these three social systems can be used ultimately for higher purposes but none of these should be absolutized if hierarchy is made the absolute value then it becomes a problem if equality is made the absolute value then it becomes a problem autonomy is made the absolute value if autonomy is made absolute well what is the problem that everybody is doing their own thing and nobody is caring for the larger good 
That's why John F. Kennedy has said that ask not what the country has done for you, ask what you have done for the country. So, nation. So the point is that uh, with respect to in, uh, with respect to your this question about this, well, it does uh, about are these innate? Yes, it does seem like that. That there are no more and more as we have I talk from the Shastri perspective, but for a scientific perspective, as we have more and more brain imaging being done and neuroscience advancing, it seems that different people are wired differently. There are some people who are wired to to respect hierarchy. Now they will respect the hierarchy and they will rise high up in the hierarchy. You know, yeah, I was, I was where was that? In other Scotland, oh, there was one teenager girl. She's a Scottish girl, and she said hey, we were driving along. There's one devotee driving. And he says he a devotee immediately says that you know the sitting behind. She said hey. You know, you're going above the speed limit. Okay, he slowed down. He says, no, you're not meant to go like this. Not yet. Then I asked her, do you like rules? So I love rules. I mean, who will say I love rules? She said, rules bring order. Now, of course, there's a perverse joy when people say they love rules. They love to impose rules on others. <laughs> <laughs> that is also possible. <laughs> but many times they themselves will respect rules. And they get very agitated if others won't respect rules. So, so from a from the shastric perspective, the scriptural perspective, we all have certain samskaras from the past. So some people by then samskaras are meant. They have that samskara by which they want order, they want structure. Some people want equality. Some people want autonomy. Whatever social structure you have, I don't care. I respect it. Not that I want to fight against it. But let me do my. Own. So you could say that there is an overall cultural ethos and that can come from one's past life karma. So it's not that the liberals, the conservatives, the left these people, they have complete disagreement of values. See like American parents or Indian parents, all parents care for their children. All parents want their children to grow up and become good, wonderful people. But, so the, it's not the values are different, it is which value is prioritized is different. It's not that when people have a value hierarchy, they don't value at autonomy or equality at all. They feel hierarchy is more important. Or somebody says, okay, hierarchy is important, but I want to do my own. Autonomy is more important for me. Is it become too abstract or it's clear overall? No, no, it, it does make sense, Prabhu. Uh, so just to complete this now, coming to our topic of fighting the inner war, you know, everybody has to fight the inner war, but depending on, like say consider different professions, if somebody is an artist, artists are very creative and creativity cannot be legislated. You cannot be, you cannot have creativity as a 9 to 5 job. So you may decide that 9 to 5 I will do a creative work. But that doesn't mean throughout 9 to 5 we will get equal amount of creative ideas all the time. So generally creative people require autonomy. Mm -hmm. And that's how artists work. So they need their space. Even in big companies like uh, Intel, Google, all of these, they have like special departments which they say they, they have different mavericks, genius, different words they use for that. And for those people, they have no daily job deadlines, they have no daily time log, what did you do from this time to this time to this time. We just give them autonomy. And for six months they may do no work. And at the end of the sixth month they may bring up an idea which can change the whole industry. So they realize that some people need that and they need the space and they are given that space. So I'd say that different professions also require different degrees of they require different values to be prominent. Like somebody is a doctor, somebody is a surgeon. No, oh, hierarchy is very important over. The surgeon tells the nurse, get this. The nurse says, no, I'll be creative, I'll get something else. It won't work at that time, is it? <laughs> so, there are certain professions also where certain values will be more important. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, Prabhu. 
Prabhu, one, uh, I, I must say one thing. Your, your command over global history is terrific. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I once gave a class. After that, one devotee came. He said, your class was terrible. Then <laughs> what? He was so happy. I was thinking, was he being sarcastic? He said, was, what did he say? He said, the class was terrible. Okay. And I asked him, okay, what did you find terrible about the class? And he started speaking all good points. Then after that I realized his English was not very good. He wanted to say terrific and he said terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhu, I'm sure I said and meant terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhu, uh, we were discussing about fighting the inner battles where uh, heal, hierarchy, equality and autonomy, even in our personal, in our daily lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are many decisions that we like to be autonomous about. Uh, there are many decisions or activities that hierarchy makes more sense to us. Prove when you're fighting all these inner battles with different strategies, where does a devotional practice or bhakti come into the play or come into the scene? And does it help you overcome these battles, or how 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 do you place your devotional practice in all of this? Well, two ways. At one level. Bhakti becomes one more battle you have to fight. <laughs> because at one level, we have so many things to do and this becomes one more thing which we have to do. And quite often, we don't feel like doing it. So, it, it does at one level, it does become one more battle we have to fight. But at another level, this is a battle which can empower us to fight other people. It is like an athlete. The athlete at the actual time is he want to go and perform. They have to perform in athlete. But before that they have to do a lot of workouts. The, some, uh, the workout itself they will be like a battle. I don't want to do it. But the workout that they do, that will prepare them. The more they do the workouts, the better trained they are, the better they will actually will perform. When my friend is in the military, he says that you know, the more you sweat in peace, the less you will bleed in war. Or a sober statement. The more you sweat in peace, and the more you train, the more you are vigorous, the more you become alert, then the less you will bleed in war. So in that sense, bhakti is like that battle, say if you do a sadhana every morning, then bhakti is like that battle which you fight at the start of the day, do a sadhana, and that gives us clarity, greater clarity. So, once we get that greater clarity, all the other battles become relatively easier to fight. And uh, say, if we have anger issues, we have anxiety issues, we have resentment, we have insecurity, whatever issues we have, if at the start of the day, we have connected ourselves with Krishna, basically, you know, what does this, what does Bhakti actually do for us? In general, for us, the world is very big. And Krishna is very small. Yeah, he's up there somewhere. When I started practicing bhakti, I started sharing it with my friends and relatives. So my uncle said, yeah, I believe in God. He's happy there, I'm happy here. (laughs) So the idea is, often God doesn't seem to be very relevant. Mm-hmm. But when we connect, when we practice bhakti, when we do our sadhana, then what happens for us is the world becomes smaller and Krishna becomes bigger. And when this happens, now we may say, what is the relevance of, what, what is the benefit of the world becoming smaller and Krishna becoming bigger? Now I'm not saying the world becomes Maya in the sense of false. That's not our philosophy. The world is also real. But when the world becomes smaller, then the world's problems don't threaten us so much. We don't feel so overwhelmed by the world's problems. And we also don't feel so captivated by the world's pleasures. So both ways, the world is a place of divan. Kabi kushi, kabi gam. So, if the world is big, then every duality seems to be very big for us. So, you know, one day I go to office or I go to college and I uh, some professor compliments he did a good job. This college is so wonderful, this is the best course. 
I love it. And next day the professor gave us some feedback. So why did I even choose this school? I hate it. So those dualities keep us emotionally unsteak. But when the world becomes small for us, then will the dualities become small. So we'll find that we will be less shaken by life's ups and downs. And in that sense, for us, when we are chanting the holy names, when we are hearing many class, when we are praying to Krishna, it is not just a ritual that we get the, the purpose of doing our sadhana is to give ourselves a reminder that there is a bigger reality. That there is, that the, the, normally the way we function, yes, the world will be prominent in our consciousness. And it needs to be because we want to tackle, we want to function in the world effectively. But at the background, we need to be aware that there is a bigger reality. And it's like, at the start of the day, we bring ourselves here to Sabina. And by the end of the day, we will lie down over it. And again, the next day when we start, we again have to get ourselves there. So this is our sadhana that will get us here. So the world's battles, quite often like you know, in cricket or the score, there are mind games. And previously the Australians were known for upon or what is the word? Sledging. 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 Yeah, sledging. So, you know, when I went to Australia, people there are very cool and laid back. Like after a class, nobody even asks questions because they're very laid back. And I asked them, this is not the image of Australia and India. <laughs> they're very aggressive. They're, they're laid back in everything except cricket. <laughs> <laughs> but sledging is there. So, so the thing is that there are mental games that are played. So often, when we face the world's problems, there are problems out there, no doubt. And there are pleasures out there. But the mind can make the pleasures seem far bigger than what they actually are. And the mind can make the problems seem far bigger than what they are. So if the world is the only reality in our consciousness, then we get very shaken by the likes of and downs. So, yes, now to remind ourselves that there is a bigger reality, on a daily basis, that required so that is a battle. But once we have fought that battle and we have reminded ourselves that Krishna is the bigger reality, then the remaining battles become easier to fight because at the mental level we are not intimidated or dominated. How can I keep this up? This is so big, how can I face it? With respect to pleasure and trouble. That's how it in the net result. It is hugely beneficial. It can help us. It is a battle that can help us to fight all our other battles better. Prabhu, matlab agar wo battle jeetna hai, we have to fight one battle that is your sadhana or your early morning whatever practice that you have. Prabhu, it it intrigues me at this point to ask. So, it is just yesterday I read an article which came in Harvard Medical School Medical. Uh, Howard Medical School published in a website. They said that one of the biggest uh, neglected factors of social health and social health policies is religion and spiritual practice. There are now numerous surveys which have been done which find that people who have some kind of committed spiritual practice or even religious affiliation, well, I mean, said that they go to a church or a temple or a mosque. They go regularly, they are less prone to mental health problems like depression, suicidal ideation, anxiety, addiction, and even physical issues, vulnerable to heart attacks, strokes. So, survey after survey has been done, and it's almost always in Francis Street. So, Sigmund Freud had this idea that religion is an illusion, opiate. So this article said that if religion is an opiate, then it is a very healthy opiate. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Wow. Uh, Prabhu, uh, at this point it intrigues me to ask you, uh, one battle, one inner battle that you fought, or one personal challenge that you fought, and maybe your teachings from the Gita, or your spiritual practices, Helped you get get yourself out of it, get victorious over it. 
or and i always had a struggle with anger and i was never physically violent but i was always very good at words and having a short temper and a great vocabulary is a terrible combination <laughs> <laughs> you know some people get angry and they just become incoherent you can see they are angry but you can't even make sense of what they are saying but some people if they are really articulate and they are angry they can become so sarcastic and insult and cut people that creates lifelong wounds so i was like that <laughs> so i can't say that i have completely conquered anger i don't think uh, anybody can do that but uh, at least to uh, 70 80% uh, i have been able to restrain my anger and uh, i would say that has a two components it one is it is almost sub- it was almost it worked at a subconscious level as i started practicing bhakti it it just almost to my Uh, angry outburst magically decreased mm-hmm. i would say that was at least 50% the remaining 30% was conscious work so that means that by the practice of bhakti i uh, i came a little more sattva guna i started anticipating so, saying when we are in sattva guna sattva is associated with more clarity so if we have more clarity then we can anticipate which situations we are likely to get provoked and then we better prepare for those situations we try to avoid those situations so that has been something which has been substantially helpful for me even now when i get angry i have a policy that if i'm angry i will just dictate a very angry or in message or that type of very angry in me because that anger is there within me i want to get it out of me just i don't know see what happens if anger is there and if anger if we express it it burns others you yeah. but if we repress it it burns us <laughs> so what i do is i just get it out of my i write it down journaling has been very helpful for me so i just write it down i dictate it but i will not send it for at least 24 hours so i get it off the chest and keep it and keep it pending for 24 hours after 24 hours i come back and rehear it or reread it that's me with all this is a bit too harsh maybe i'll if i have written five points in that time okay you know one point is just this is just too normal this one point is a reasonable point maybe i need to explain it a little bit this one point i need to get more information so basically when again this is like an example of negotiation between lower self and the higher self so it's like i am expressing it but this expressing is pride mm-hmm. so let me get it out of myself the lower self is angry and i cannot wish away the lower self and that but i don't want to others to be hit by my lower so okay let me express it and then let me wait and observe and then and i evaluate it after a day i find that sometimes i don't feel the need to send any message at all if i send the message i will substantially edited and softened or balanced or it may even become a, from an angry outburst may just become a set of questions you know what exactly happened can you explain when when this happened why by what what made you do this what how did you arrive at this is you know how do i even speak like this and so its anger has been a uh, it's been a constant uh, challenge for me and bhakti has substantially helped me to it wow and prabhu uh, you've taken the time and effort to consciously work on on mm-hmm. on stuff wow it's it's there is some part of it which works just magically mm. but if the transformation requires hard work it makes some conditionings how should i put let's say so in india wanted to regain control of kashmir i have a friend who is in kashmir 
Now he's deputed over there. He said in some part the militants didn't really have much control over there. So when the Indian army decided to clamp down on it, they got the control of those parts very easily. But the other parts, it was very difficult for them to reach there because it was very tightly interested militants mixed with civilians and who's a militant, who is a supporter of a militant, who is a neutral person. So they had to reach there became much more difficult. So like that I feel by bhakti, some battles are one or some parts of the battle are won very easily. And some battles require them. Uh, Prabhu, yes, you said uh, some battles do require effort and I'm sure each and every one of us, maybe professionally, in our own relationships or emotionally, we are fighting our own inner battles, big or small. And we do get injured. If you're fighting a war, yes, you will get injured. Prabhu, how important do you feel? Is it to forgive yourself for the mistakes you've made in the past? or unknowingly or unintentionally that have happened, that have repercussions, but do you just sit and beat yourself down or how do you forgive yourself and move on? It's a difficult decision. It's uh, going back to the war example. In a, if a soldier is wounded, you don't send them to the prison. You send them to the hostel. Because a wound needs to be treated. But suppose that soldier was running away from the battle. Now, running away from a battlefield for a soldier is considered to be an extremely serious robbery. It's, they are called deserters. Then, if the soldier was a deserter, then their wounds need to be treated, but they also need to be punished in some ways. So basically, when, when there is some kind of shortcoming or wrongdoing, there are two distinct approaches. One is like the moral approach and the other is the chemical approach. That means what? Like the moral approach is this is wrong and you are responsible for doing some people and therefore you need to be pleased. So generally the right takes the moral approach. The left takes the clinical approach. Clinical approach means that say for example alcoholism. Now if somebody is an alcoholic in the west where the other people drink very often their philosophy is drink but don't get drunk. So the idea is that you have to be a responsible drinker. They don't think, they don't think that drinking is itself responsible. But anyway, whatever it is. But the point is that the even in the West, if somebody used to drink too much, you know, you need to control yourself. So alcoholism is considered, say, to be an individual problem. You have to become more responsible. You have to have more willpower. But as Times are changing, leftist thoughts is spreading more and more. Now alcoholism is seen not as a moral defect, it is seen as a medical disorder. And an alcoholism needs to be treated, not, not disciplined. Now which is true? Now if it is, if, a alcohol, if alcoholism is a disease, then the person needs to go to a hospital. But if alcoholism, it's a moral defect, yeah, the person needs to be punished. The person, the person drinks and drives, and they may have their driving license taken away, they may put in jail. So, which is true? Well, it depends. But what does it depend on? That, say, when I was in Canada, I had gone to Calgary to a university to give a class over there. and that university happened to be on top of a hill and it was freezing winter. You know, Canada, the western part of Canada is actually colder. Canada, Calgary, Vancouver are much colder than Toronto. Toronto itself is very cold. But so Calgary, this was on top of a hill and as we were driving up a winding road up the hill, we 
saw how a snowball is actually formed. So at the top is just a snow pebble. And if some person were there over here, they could just kick it with their toe and it would crack apart. But if it starts coming down, it starts becoming bigger. It becomes a snowball. Then it becomes a snow rock. By the time it comes down, it becomes a snow boulder. And there, if a person is there, the person will get crushed. See, the same thing. So like that with respect to alcoholism. Somebody goes to college. And then college and the parents say, let's drink. I said, no, I don't want to drink. Parents told me, if you don't want to drink, it's a bad habit. Come on, grow up. Don't be a baby. Say, okay, let me try on once. And somebody tries out drinking one, somebody tries out uh, drugs one. Because at that time, it's like a pebble. You could just say no, it can just crack apart. But if somebody drinks once, twice, thrice, ten times, fifty times. After that, it's the inner impressions become so strong, it's almost beyond the capacity of the person to see you. So at that time, even if the person is sincere, they say, I want to give it up. But they may have to admit themselves into some rehabilitation center. Where they are externally denied access to alcohol. Of course, they are given external support and other things. So, the point I am making is that if something is a matter of willpower, if something happened because of a failing of willpower, then punishing or disciplining the person is helpful. But if something was beyond the capacity of their willpower, like if a giant snowball is coming, a snow boulder is coming towards me and I fail to stop it, and you punish me for failing to stop it, that's terrible, that's unfair. So we have to understand when we are fighting the inner battles, which battles are winnable for us. And which battles may not be winnable for us. And that doesn't mean we have to be defeated in those battles and that we won't, we have to be destroyed by them. That means we may need some external protection. We may need some external support to be able to fight those battles. So the idea is that should we always forgive ourselves when even something wrong or something we fall short of our own expectations, our aspirations, our values, our purposes, well, not always. Sometimes we have to be hard on ourselves. Now, sometimes when it was possible for us to make a healthier choice and we failed, uh, then we have to be, we have to be strong on ourselves. I have to, to put myself in there. There are times when it's not that that is completely beyond our willpower, but at that time it may be beyond our willpower. So we need to be kind to ourselves. So the key point I'll say is how do we conclude this? You know, when to be hard on ourselves and when to be kind to ourselves, when to be gentle with ourselves. The key point is that our relationship with ourselves. This relationship needs to be an healthy relationship. So, now what does a healthy relationship mean? Mm -hmm. Generally, the characteristic of a healthy relationship. A healthy relationship, the broad view is that two things, two characteristics. You know, there is pleasure. If we are in a healthy relationship with someone, being with that person, we like it. We enjoy it, that romantic relationship or a friendly relationship, whatever. If you are in a healthy relationship, we like to be with that person. There is pleasure, but there is also growth. That, the being with that person makes me a better person. And I think that person inspires that person to be good. So the healthiest relationship is where there is both pleasure and growth. So like that, for us, if we think about ourselves, and as soon as we think about ourselves, if our first thought is, I'm such a fool, I can do that right, and I didn't do that right, and I didn't do that right. 
then a like some people there is cell clotrim that is not there we all have certain things which we can like about ourselves we all have certain things which we may not like about ourselves so now we have to make sure that the part of ourselves that we like that has to be adequately highlighted so otherwise if as soon as i start thinking about myself as soon as say i have some free time when i'm not busy doing this thing or that thing meeting with this person or meeting that deadline then as soon as i have free time the first thought of myself is no you why didn't you do that right you fool why didn't you do that right you are such a terrible person that's not it so if the default thought of our senses is negative i repeat it, that is not a healthy situation but on the other side as soon as we have some free time for us and you know oh i have a great person i did this and i did that and i did that and i did that so if we deny or downplay completely the parts of us which need work see then that is also a problem so like in a healthy relationship no person is ideal mm-hmm. we all have limitations see they what is that love is blind but marriage is an eye opening <laughs> so now we all have parts of us which we like parts of us which we dislike really parts of us parts of the other person but if we are serious about a relationship we will focus on the parts that we like and we will manage the part that we dislike the parts that need work so you know that is saying it all works in progress now there is another word called progress not progress but progress so while we are making progress we often make a mess but while making that mess are we going upwards or are we going down so i would say we have to look at ourselves carefully overall our relationship with ourselves should be healthy the healthy relationship means as a set of things we our focus is on the positives within us but there is awareness of the negatives and we are also adequately working on the negatives so if there is only if i if say if i talk about my relationship with myself if i am only looking at positives only positives then that would lead to ego that will lead to arrogance and a typical example of arrogant person like normally if you meet someone you will say that if somebody else is a famous person so it's an honor to meet you it's an honor for me to meet you but an example of an egoistic person is and if you meet someone he says it's an honor for you to meet me <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine somebody saying like that <laughs> but it may be true but that person should not say that <laughs> so like ego is one for focus only on one's positives but on the other hand if we focus only on one's negatives that will lead to insecurity that will lead to feelings of inferiority uh, this can spiral down to depression and so many other things can happen so that's why the balance is our focus is on the positives but there is awareness of the negatives not just awareness in the positives we are also working on it so in so should we forgive ourselves when we make some mistakes yes so that our entire energy is not going in beating ourselves down what a terrible mistake i made terrible mistake i made but should we just forgive ourselves nonchalantly i know no big deal too oh, i didn't make a mistake over here and what do i learn from this what do i learn from this so that at least i am better prepared sometimes we say we should never make the same mistake again but sometimes that's not possible because some conditioning is so strong that we make the make same mistake again and again but okay even if i make the same mistake again maybe i can prevent making that mistake to the same degree last time i went on social media and i spent 7 hours and now from today onwards i'll never be on social media 
then that's not going to work into it. But maybe I can plan in such a way that I have some obligatory engagement so that, you know, even if I spend some time, I will only after half an hour, one hour, I have something else to do and I do that and I create some engagements. I don't create, I don't let long slots of blank time available for me in which which could be sucked in by, by just mindless entertainment or whatever. So we may still lose an inner battle, but we may not lose it that bad. So that way we can prepare ourselves. So basically, it's like going to have the positives and negatives, only positives. If we are just forgiving ourselves, mm -hmm. that will again, like earlier I said, there will be no improvement in stagnation or degradation. But we are just uh, uh, overlooking or denying our shortcomings, our mistakes. That's also not good. So in between, it's with acknowledging and then acting. Acting not to necessarily to prevent it forever, but at least we are better prepared to face it. If it is, Pro, uh, you drew that uh, the image of a snow uh, pebble, and it snowballs into a snow boulder. It reminds me of uh, many instances, you know, where. Many of my college friends who started drinking by uh, with, with that same thing, you know, just try one one peg. It's it's not much. Just one beer here and there. It's not much. But then they start rationalizing with it. You know, that society has been so unfair to me. Family has been so unfair to me, and uh, so many things have not worked in my favor. And and that's the reason I've been drinking. It's it, it's not me who is the problem. But but these are the ones who are the, who 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 are, who are the main cause for me getting into this. And by what you've uh, explained, Prabhu, that we do, there is a chance we, we do get in that spiral where we think, oh, I was not bad, I was never bad. It's these people, these circumstances who've made me bad. Mm. And there lies a bigger challenge to change, you know, because I was never bad at all. So, yeah, there is truth to that. And after I started traveling to America, we realized that and at least my childhood was so protected. Although I had lost my mother when I was just 13, 14, just my father took very good care of me. When uh, I, I, see, I look at kids in America and see their parenting is so complicated. Then there's sometimes who's a uh, domestic violence and a small thing, but it's many other things where kids come, not all kids, I don't want the stereotype of men. It was America, it was a huge country, people in India, and a lot of refuses, but see, you know, there are broken families, and this one is like domestic violence, this is at a physical level, another thing is emotional level. Kids are traumatized when they work in such difficult situations, emotionally drained, polluted, they sometimes you know, the couple separates, both of them try to poison the mind of the kid against the other, other parent. That's so immature. And the kid becomes like a tennis ball between the two parents. It's terrible. So yes, you find this problem. And at one level, we do understand that life is not just tough, life is unfair in the way. That means life is difficult for everyone. But some people it is part in difficult moments. And psychologically we all feel everyone feels that my life is tougher than everyone's. No, I'm not saying that it's just psychological. It's objectively true. When I was in Scotland and I met some devotees who were in Ukraine. And they said just they had a flourishing community, devotees, they were having their own professions. I met one devotee who was a doctor in Ukraine. And he was now driving an Uber in Scotland because the medical certification in Ukraine is not recognized in in UK. So that's the, that's the terrible thing for them. So, so we all may have our problems, and we can't say that our problems are anywhere close to somebody whose whole life has been. So there are degrees of problems, no doubt. And certainly, if somebody has been through the difficulties and somebody seeks some 
some escape way from that difficulty which makes life worse that is understanding having said that we humans we always need at our core spiritual beings like that is a incredible capacity for resilience if the example is people say as why are so many people depressed i say the question you should be asking me is why is everyone not depressed when life is so difficult and especially now we get depressing news from everywhere in the world is it the human mind is not designed for having so much negativity uh, coming in from everywhere no like people are glued to social media and the question is not why so many people are glued to social media why is it that everyone is not glued to social media all the time because he these they means they go that is by the devi so the spiritual part of us the atma is indestructible it's not just at a spiritual level in terms of it it cannot be destroyed our there is an indefatigable spirit in all of us so that can be manifested to a lesser or greater degree but it is said and some of the most inspiring stories in human history are stories of people who have risen above their circumstances people who came from very bad backgrounds but they actually arose above them and that's what inspires i was speaking in google a few months ago hey so I'm telling an incident from my childhood and then you notice that I need crutches for walking so when I was the one I got polio basically I was given a vaccine uh, but the vaccine was uh, I was in a small town and the fridge in which the doctor had kept the vaccine and the fridge had lost its power the previous day so basically what happened uh, because of lack of refrigeration the germs grew and the vaccine instead of preventing polio ended up giving me So I was just walking normally, and I fell down, and I could never walk normally after that. So, my, of course, I don't remember this, but my first memory of this is when I was growing up, or only I was two and a half, three, or whatever. Some relative had come to meet us, and a relative was consoling my mother, saying that it's so sad that your son got polio. And my mother, I remember, was speaking very. clear confident voice whatever he lacks physically god will provide him intellectually <laughs> now i got over two and a half three i don't know what intellectual size i had seen for my mother i had shown for my mother to say that but somehow from that time onwards i started identifying more of my intellectual self So when I went, was growing up, I couldn't play other games like other kids could play, and people said that was unfair. But then, when I started studying, I could read much faster than other kids. I could understand things much better. I could articulate far more clearly. I could remember so much better than anyone else. And I realized that I didn't do anything to deserve this either. So I give a lot of credit to my mother for this. That although she said. God will give you. I didn't think about God. I only took 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 out the intellectual at that part. But somehow from that time I identified my intellectual side much more than my physical side. And so the physical side doesn't occupy a lot of head space for me. For me, my crutches are like my glasses. I can't see very well without my glasses. But it's no big deal. You know, put on the glasses and pick up the crutches and move on with life. You don't have to, doesn't have to occupy a lot of mental space. So all of us. have difficulties in our the different kinds of difficulties and uh, yes you could say our past can explain our emotions like no, feel like putting i just feel like forgetting all this bad thing yeah watching your doing this doing that our past can explain our emotions but our past doesn't excuse our actions Mm-hmm. it doesn't excuse our actions that is for us we have the capacity to be in a small way 
so yes some people could say that in this particular situation uh, this is what happened because of this i started drinking okay maybe true but if we know we can make small better choices and yes, we can it grow so we are shaped by our circumstances but we are not completely controlled by our circumstances so everybody has some terrible situation in their life but everybody has some blessings and uh, if we focus on those blessings then that can give us a positive yeah it's not that my life is on condemned so if we do that then i think we can make better decisions yeah. so it is not easy i mean said that so i don't know if my mother had not said that strange way that she could have not a uh, created such a thing by me no not my mother was not saying that to me i don't remember her repeating it anytime after that and she was speaking i just happened to be there and i heard it and it had an impact on me so there is uh, my understanding is that krishna god will give us some light some path toward light and if we take that path we will see there is more light but if we don't take that path if we just keep choosing the dark side then we will go into worry or darkness but having said that you know, i wouldn't uh, blame someone if they have made bad choices really it's like uh, yeah the bad choices are being made but uh, let's see what good choice you can do now if somebody says you know, can't live without it okay instead of six drinks then you take four drinks what can you do right now maybe in some situations some things cannot be given like if somebody has gone down to the snow boulder then that battle you can't fight but does that mean you can't fight any battle in conclusion this one last point that see we all have the lower side within us it has these surges so we have our urges and the urges have surges so somebody like somebody that i'll call me somebody has a drug somebody has a tv binge somebody has overeating whatever it is it, the those urges are there and those urges become high it is almost impossible to see them it from maybe it's true but what about in between you know urge however destructive it is it dominates a person 24 hours a day with the same degree of severity alcoholic will be always ready to drink but that doesn't mean they are driven to drink all the time with the same degree of urge okay maybe when that urge comes you cannot fight it back maybe you cannot win that back mm-hmm. but what about a group three can you do something at that time you feel sorry for yourself and even when the urge is not there keep drinking more or now i want to do something of that so it's like going back to the war metaphor there are invaders which are like the raiders and invaders which are occupiers so temptation as a raider might be unavoidable like when the temptation comes as a, on a raid you know the word raid somebody attacks and plunders when they come on a raid then they can come back raid you said that's a common word so when it comes as a raid we may not be able to resist it but you don't have to let it become a watchful fire that is something you can avoid uh, even if somebody is drinking too much you don't have to define them as alcoholic and keep drinking when they you know okay the urge is not that strong right now there are sometimes say somebody is depressed there are sometimes this feelings of depression they just overwhelm us you know we work very hard in some some area and uh, we don't do very well and somebody else has much better than okay that time we put feel that but i and that time i just feel not possible to think about anything else okay that time we are down for maybe 6 hours one day but after that 
Do I have to let it occupy my mind all the time? Can I not think of something else? Can I not fill my mind something else? Well, that is where Krishna consciousness can be very important. So even if we can't resist the urges, we can persist between the urges. And that is the hope for us. Yes, there are times when we may be reminded of all the things that are wrong in our life. And it might just overwhelm us with many things. But those don't have to become our constant thoughts. So when we have the opportunity to think of something else, do something, let's do that. Oh, we can't resist, that's okay. But we can persist, persist in doing something else, something more constant. Wow. Uh, thank you Prabhu. Thank you for uh, that wonderful explanation and I'd like to thank your mother too. She really played Nostradamus th that time. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, Prabhu. And at this uh, point, <clears throat> I'd like to give our beloved audience a chance to pose questions to uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. So, I'll circulate the uh, mic from here. And oh, you do have mics? Okay. And thank you so much, Tawaji, for the insightful lecture. A point that really inspired me was how important it is to prioritize our spiritual activities in the morning, and that will help us fight the dualities for the rest of the day. Uh, Tawaji, sometimes uh, what happens is that we reach a certain point in our life that we achieve that seamlessness and that consistency in our spiritual life, and we gain a sort of holistic balance in our material and spiritual life. But then it's like Maya ki khushi. Maya se hum, humari khushi dekhi nahi jati. So, you know, there is circumstantial um, problems that kind of mess up our entire schedule and, you know, uh, make things out of place. And we may end up creating perceptions in our mind like, oh, maybe Krishna doesn't see my progress. Or, you know, uh, perceptions like, why does life have to be unfair with me? And the devotee loses out the entire willpower in regaining that consistency back in life. So how do we fight that war? Yeah, sometimes we say we should be consistent. But I think consistent, being consistent is too difficult in life. So if we can't be consistent, we can be resilient. Consistent means I'm always at this level. Resilient means from here, I may go down sometimes, then I'll rise up. We go down and rise up. So when I said morning sadhana, sometimes life needs to be too difficult. And sometimes we maybe you have some work you quite late night, sometimes the health is not good. Sometimes we may just not have that uh, mental disposition. So okay, wherever we we need to give us in some space, give that space. But if we have a healthy relationship with ourselves, we work on that. Then okay, I need this space right now. And you know, yesterday was a very tiring day. But today I can't do this in the morning. I'll do it later in the morning. That's okay. So be resilient. Sometimes the struggle to be consistent, it's good to try to be consistent. But sometimes the struggle to be consistent can make us riddled with guilt about not being consistent. And when that happens, then unnecessarily we are losing energy with that guilt. So, okay, at this time this did work. That's okay. Let me accept that as other times are difficult in life. And uh, no on with it. It's one more thing I would say is that is it that Krishna is not seeing our progress? Or Krishna is not seeing our struggles? It can certainly feel like that at times. And well, philosophically, we understand that Krishna never abandons us. Now, Krishna is with us and Krishna is within us all the time. But sometimes it doesn't feel like that. So, we can't just wish away our feelings. At that time, we need association of demons. And you know, there are, among, among, even among devotees, devotee association also, some devotee association is we could say more expecting from us 
do this, do this, and that's also required for Almo. But some devotee association is more accepting. And we need both kind of associations. So when we are in difficulty and we are down, at that time if we associate devotees who are only expecting from us, that they will only get on our case and we will, they will end up feeling worse. So we have to know which devotees are more accepting and what role they play in our life and which devotees are more expecting and what role they play in our life. We need to have both kind of association. Then even if we don't feel the Krishna connection directly ourselves, we can feel the Krishna connection through devotees. Hare Krishna Namaste, thank you so much for the in class, very inspiring. Uh, this had a probably like very silly question, but sometimes we get overwhelmed with a lot of things happening and then our mind or our brain goes like please and we don't even process what is going on and then to even identify, okay, this is a problem, this is the cause of the problem, this is the effect that is having it, this is how we get back with it. Sometimes the the feeling of getting overwhelmed is so much that like you just stop and then you go another and you just do it, start doing things in a very mechanical way. So what I Yeah. See, the mind in some ways if we consider is like the body. Is the soul, mind and body. We are sometimes we say we are not the body. And it's true, but we live through the body. The body is not unimportant for us. It is not the most important thing. So the soul, mind and body are all three parts of who we are. And sometimes the mind also becomes weak. Then the body becomes weak. See, sometimes uh, if some, some people have some sickness, physical sickness, suddenly they lose energy. What can you do? Some people have migraine. Just get an attack. Then at that time, they just have to see no light, close their eyes, and just be alone and recover. So, sometimes our mind is like that. Okay, this is the machine, this is the tool that we have. I have this kind of body mind machine and I have to work with it. Especially because we are in a competitive world and we don't, generally, nobody talks about their particular limitations in public. So, we think, oh, yeah, I have this limitation, nobody else has a limitation about this. But everybody has their issues. So, we can't always anticipate it, but we might be able to see some patterns when this happens. So, if somebody knows that, okay, these are the times when, then say, I tend to get some weakness or physical weakness, then maybe at that time I won't do any physically demanding activity. Or if I'm going out somewhere, I won't go out alone, let's go with someone else. So, if something goes wrong there, then. So, like that, try to anticipate or see some patterns in when we tend to become, our mind tends to become numb or just blank. And try to make sure that we are not making any major decisions at that time. We are not uh, doing things which are very high stake. And then gradually we just navigate through that phase. The Krishna says, Tam, Satiksha, Surhara, the tolerate. The tolerate doesn't just mean tolerate externals, but we tolerate the internals also. And this is the way the mind is right. And at least function with it, whatever I can. So don't so what happens because the mind is inside us, we start identifying too much with our mind. I've written a book called You Are Not Your Mind, You Are Better. So the idea is because our mind is inside us, we often equate mental weakness with a character plan. But it's not, it's just for mind. And some people can have a weak mind, or some people can, their mind can go through phases of weakness at times. So, just two things I would say anticipate it and try to avoid taking high stake decisions in the back time. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm saying what you're saying. There's the mic. Hi. Um, so before I question, uh, grades of Navdev Kunari, user, comprehensive. Thank you so much. 
I don't think you can prevent it completely. <laughs> right? It is uh, sometimes that expectation that we will not self-sabotage. That expectation itself causes self-sabotage. Is it it? So, you know, there are, there are forces inside us which work against us and they are not going to go away overnight. They are going to be there. You like say, I'm going back to Kashmir situation. I have this friend. Now, Kashmir is literally more peaceful. But that doesn't mean they don't need more security in the rest of the country. But there are still insurgent elements which are there. Now, some people may just see, okay, there is no point in this insurgency. You know, we can be a part of India and we can progress nicely. But some people are just, we have to be against India. So, that some there will be some kind of self-sabotage that will always happen. I would say always. It will happen for a long time. But, again, if we have an attitude of curiosity towards our mind, towards ourselves basically. So then, okay, what are the times or situations when I time trying to self sabotage? So for example, like say some good things have happened to me or some good things I have done. Now I'm going to do something bad. Maybe, maybe not. So we could we the mind does not generally use unlimited tricks to fool us. It, it can, but it has some typical ways in which it tricks us. And so if we can find those and note those and then we say here are some classes, we read some good wisdom literature, find out some ways to counter it. So, like, if the enemy is going to, if somebody is going to battlefield, then the enemy is going to attack. Then I need to have armor to defend myself, I need to have weapons to defend myself. So like that, inside us are our mind, inside us are intentions. So, now if our mind comes up with some ideas, some kind of reasoning, oh you know, now that you've done 10, one, ten good things, now you're going to make a mess of things. Well, not necessarily. We can find out with the intelligence counters to the mind's arguments. And this is where I feel affirmations can be helpful. Earlier I said, now affirmations, if they are about truths, they are, they are statements that are just not true. Like if a 5 feet person says, I am 7 feet tall. And you make affirmation like that. That kind of affirmations will be actually damaging. But affirmations about things that we ourselves know are true, but we tend to forget them. Those kind of affirmations are very helpful. So look at typical patterns of what are the things that the mind thinks about. Okay, the mind says, you know, okay, you may be good, but there are so many other people better than me. Okay. But does it mean that just because there are people better than me, that is, there is no space for me in the world? No, I have no space. So if our mind tends to compare a lot and create insecurity, then we have, we have probably heard some classes about avoiding comparing mentality. So uh, find some thoughts, some quotes, keep them in your phone, in some app or something like that. And when the mind starts going in that typical direction of self-sabotage, see sometimes the mind just ambushes us. You know, it just completely an attack out of the, like a bolt out of the blue. But many times we can start sensing that okay, now I'm going in this direction. It's sometimes like anger comes like a sudden burst of rage. But sometimes we can notice I'm becoming, becoming a little irritated right now. Not only I'm irritated, I'm becoming irritable now. That means any further things will irritate me more. So when you start noticing that itself, you maybe take a pause, take a few deep breaths, maybe read some quotes about anger, about managing our emotions, and then come back. So basically, prepare ourselves, then uh, we will be able to minimize the damage due to self-sabotage. So typical, even if you take three things, 
what are the three typical ways my mind takes me down okay. and then what are the points that i can use to challenge it or counter it at that time we write it down that can be very helpful and then just read it sometimes not just read it in the mind read it aloud if you have some quote mm. you read it aloud see uh one of my favorite quotes about anger is that those who anger us conquer us mm. my my anger may be genuine but if they impel me to anger in the to act out in their anger that way then they are conquering me not only controlling they are conquering me mm. so okay so when i read that okay okay let me calm down to basically find out some strategies for anticipating and preparing for the phases of self psychology mm-hmm. I'm okay, but I think all of you must also be hungry. There is another battle going on inside you. <laughs> so, if you want, we can serve the food and we can continue question answer. If, if any of you have questions, I, I want to take food here only or somewhere else. So, yeah. So you can maybe can you serve it to them directly, or they have to go there and take it. Okay. Well, let's complete this question. Then we can decide after that. So, Bob, we were recently speaking about inner self. So, when we are going through some important moments of our life, it can be an exam or interview or a presentation. What happens is that our inner self doesn't let us put in hundred percent of something. Now, it could be because of anxiety, or pressure, nervousness. So, at that point of time, what should your mindset be? even though we may might have the potential to crack something but still there is something that stops us so when in those moments what should your thinking be be conquered me well so see in when you in this kind of things what exactly is 100% how are you going to quantify that so sometimes our expectation of ourselves also becomes a pressure on ourselves now of course some there is an objective ranking we could say you know okay this question i knew the answer but i made a silly mistake or something like that but in many cases life is not that simple so when krishna says karmanne vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana what its point is that what we put into the world is in our control but what we get from the world is not in our control sometimes we worry so much about what we will get from the world that that is what prevents us or impedes us in what we put into the world so that focus like when some people say they don't care for the results that is not what the gita is teaching gita is saying definitely gita says they know this is 247 in the gita karmanne vadikaras But just few verses, 241 is devasayatmika buddhi ekhe ha kuru nandana. Be one-pointed in the goal. Don't have multiple things which distract you in multiple directions. So it's not. So there's a difference between setting goals and getting results. So goals are before we do an activity. Results are we get what we get after the activity. So Krishna is not setting don't saying don't set goals. He's saying don't be attached to results. So basically, in any activity, there is what we put in and what we get out of it. Mm-hmm. So what we put in, that is in our control, to a significant degree. Maybe not entirely, but to a significant degree. What we get out of it, that is not in our control. so quite often when we are unable to put in our 100% that is because we are getting too caught in what we will get out of it say if i am going to give a talk and if i am if i am too worried 
how do you know how will people look at me what do people think about me will people respect me will people pay attention to me now that is not in mock and to it like in a tennis match when the player is serving they have much more control i can get the ball send the ball in the forehead of the for the forehand the backhand into the body wherever but when you are returning wherever the ball is going to come that's where you have to put the racket and get the ball back into the play so like that sometimes we have much greater control over things sometimes we have much lesser control over things so what to be put in is in our country like when i came for this talk you know what i was going to speak i had prepared some things but what kind of questions would come up we told uh, that i was not completely sure I and mean, i cannot be sure i some understanding i have because i've been speaking for 30 years almost but i don't have complete control over that so i think the best way to minimize that anxiety or minimize the distracting focus uh, distracting i uh, distracting forces is to focus on what we can put in and that's why live in the present this now we want to live in the present but we also want to live for something bigger than the present that means my purpose is far bigger than the present but the progress that i want to make toward the purpose that bigger purpose is going to be in the present so in that sense let me put in the best that i can in this moment if i put in the best that i can in this moment then what what result i get that i have done my best part let the result come out so you will try to avoid anything avoid thinking of anything that is beyond our control and then we'll find that see the more we let go of the things beyond our control the more we can catch hold of the things that are in our control mm-hmm. like they say in like uh, in writing uh if and then authors get a writer's block or creativity is get a creative block so what they say is that writing is just typing one word at a time drawing is just making one line at a time so just focus on this step so if you can focus on what is in our control nobody can say that i have such a creative block that i cannot type one letter also okay maybe type one word type one more word it will move over there okay thank you good question